Hey everyone, and welcome back to Group Therapy. I'm one of your hosts, licensed clinical psychologist, Dr. Jessica Rabin. And I'm licensed psychologist, Dr. J. And I'm licensed psychologist, Dr. Kristen Casey. KBI is out this week, taking care of her mental health straight from Disney in Florida. We know you all will miss her just like we are going to, but alas, the podcast must go on. But since May is Mental Health Awareness Month, this week we are going to be talking all about new science and treatments in mental health. So settle Mm. in, take a seat, and welcome to Group Therapy. So last week on our Hot Topics in Mental Health episode, we left you with this reflection question. What is one way you are going to take care of your mental health this month? So many of you answered. I'm so excited to see how you all are taking care of your mental health. But some of the answers that we got are focused on SEEDS, S-E-E-D-S, and other tools I am learning. I'm going to make time for self-care, like exercise and rest. Also, sharing my feelings with my partner instead of bottling it up. Solid. That one. Yeah. Journal and go to counseling. I really like this one. Finally listen to my therapist and get back on meds to help me through a rough patch and big life changes. That's incredible. Love that. I thought it was just finally listen to my therapist. <laughs> yeah, like, me too. Yeah. yeah. I was like, <laughs> oh like, shit, okay. Right. Yeah. I can, that, that works we can all too. relate to that. Absolutely. <laughs> so before we actually dive into the literature on new innovations and mental health treatments, I wanted to hear from you all about what you think about novel approaches in general that may deviate from our typical like talk therapy, psychotherapy, what we were taught in grad school, what we think of as treatments for mental health disorders. I kind of get excited about them because I feel like that's how all the research kind of started originally. Like if we think about CBT, how it's like one of the most researched modalities that had to start somewhere. And maybe back then they were like, CBT, that's kind of wild. Really? You're going to do that? And, you know, look at us now. So that's kind of my initial thought. Yeah, I'm stoked about it. I think the vast, vast majority of us in the field, like really believe and know like everything's integrated, like everything's Mm -hmm. connected. Like just even in the last like 10 to 20 years, the amount of research we've learned about the gut in its relationship to mental health, where I'm sure if you would have brought that up maybe in the 80s or 70s and been like, the gut is actually really, really important to controlling the rest of people who laughed at you and been like, oh, Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, your stomach, your gut. But (laughs) this is what makes me excited because everything's connected and it Mm -hmm. just gives us a wealth of intervention points. Mm -hmm. And I know we're going to touch on both or a lot, but that's why a lot of times I listen to a lot of different podcasts, read mm-hmm. different kind of science-based things because I want to learn as much as possible, especially when it comes to our overall well-being. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really excited, especially for people that maybe talk therapy hasn't really worked or totally. um, other forms of treatment and giving people other options um, to try out. So I'm really excited as well. So do we want to just dive in? Let's do it. I'm so excited. Get these topics. God, we had hot topics last week. These feel kind of like hot, but with like a sciencey robot, like, (laughs) you know what I'm saying. (laughs) You know know exactly what I mean. Yes. Everybody listening was like, yes. When Dr. J just did that. Yep. And for the, for those of you who don't, for those of you who don't watch the video, uh, Justin put his name as I am the AI and then his pronouns. (laughs) Whereas me and Jess are just Justin Kristen. So yeah. Maybe he's the AI. Who knows? It's it's getting hard. We'll find out at this point. We We might find out in this episode. (laughs) He might have a glitch. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is psychedelics. So anyone wanna jump in? Oh yeah. I'm gonna I'm just gonna grab the steering wheel here. Psychedelics, but I also gotta say Today, we're recording this on May 4th, okay? So may the 4th be with you. And a little quote here to set this little psychedelic trip off we're about to go on from our good friend, Obi-Wan Kenobi. If you don't know who that is, you have some research to do. But here it is. You're going to find that many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view. Perspective changing, shifting our perspective. What angle are we looking from? 
let's talk about some psychedelics and your mental health people. So let's I highlighted go. three here. We got LSD. A lot of people know LSD. You've heard of LSD. You got MDMA, mm -hmm. ecstasy is what people usually think of when they think of MDMA, but also psilocybin, very popular. Stoked to talk about that. It's a mushroom. But what we've seen it be used for or effective for, and I got to first say, for starters, all these right now are still Schedule 1 in the United States. So I, I, we got to say that. I got to throw that out there. I don't know where you live in your own state laws or rules or whatever, but you know these are not legal at this point. Times are changing. We'll see. But what, what have we learned through the research on these three in particular? Well, we've seen some promising things with depression, anxiety, associative learning, which is a fancy way to saying connecting and understanding things in a new way. Mm -hmm. Like you can have a psychedelic experience and kind of see your mom in a new light that may relate to why you are the way you are, which could open you up to understand your mental health better. But also we've seen it these be helpful for treating alcohol use disorder, PTSD, sociability. I'm going to just throw a few things at you, break them down real quick. Psilocybin. Anyone really interested in this, all you have to do is check out one of the premier research institutions, John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins here. Incredible research going on there. Um, and even in the last 20 years, starting since 2000, that they're diving deep into looking at psilocybin and mental health. Uh, in 2022, this was not at Johns Hopkins. There was a great study basically comparing a very popular SSRI to using psilocybin um, and for people who had major depression. And the effectiveness of psilocybin was like off the hizzy. Like if I could use a technical <laughs> term amongst friends. 70% um, oh of the group had major reductions 57% of the psilocybin group had uh, re achieved remission. It's a what? huge, more than half wow, had wow. remission. Compared to the SSRI, only 42% had like uh, decreases in symptoms and only 28% had remission. So hot so study. Oh, wow. Wow. Hot that's... study just came out last year. Check the show notes if you want to dive in deeper. But- all these, whether you're talking about MDMA, psilocybin, LSD, they're doing these in assisted therapy ways. Mm -hmm. There's some studies I looked at where they would have conversations, like they would kind of explore things within someone's history. Some where they're just like literally guided by an expert, like just sitting there in the room. Um, but especially with MDMA, some of the most compelling research I saw was on PTSD mm -hmm. and helping yeah. reduce PTSD flashbacks. Um, and the big reason why is it reduces activity in the amygdala. So this, you know, if you deal with PTSD and you do a trauma and you're constantly in this fear state, anything that could pull you out of that, which MDMA looks like it's really helping. Plus it raises oxytocin and serotonin, which can elevate our mood a bit, but that's an amazing thing. The last thing I'll touch on and then I'll shut up LSD the research is a little more mixed. I think psilocybin, MDMA, a little more promising in some ways, but uh, McGrill University has recently found that it can, like LS, using LSD increases social interaction, which of course for someone with depression would be great. Someone mm -hmm. with social anxiety might be great. Um, and there's potential, it might be helpful for depression, anxiety. But there was also some studies I was looking at that was showing that LSD might not be better than placebo, which okay. if you know in research, that's always what we're comparing it to is like mm -hmm. uh, placebo effect is real. We know it's effective. If I hand you something, say, hey, you know, this might help you with your depression. We know for a lot of people, their depression is just going to get better. And it could be, I could have handed you a Pez. You know what I mean? <laughs> Who doesn't love Pez? Anyway. <laughs> I hope that I touched on some things that you'll find interesting. I'm very excited about psilocybin personally, but I think all three, there's real reason why we should investigate and sort of get out of this. All drugs are the same. Mm -hmm. The war on drugs means all drugs. Like we got to get out of this mindset because that's a whole nother soapbox I could get on. 
That is, it, I, first of all, I learned so much just from what you mm -hmm. said. And even with MDMA, with PTSD, I work with a lot of folks who have flashbacks, a lot of folks who have like recurrent nightmares. And when we think about the amygdala, the amygdala is the part of the brain that connects your emotions with memories. So when you are experiencing a flashback, you know, and you're kind of like in that heightened state, it's so incredible to know that MDMA could actually reduce activity in that part of the brain. It like makes so much sense, you know, and I just never connected that. It's really interesting. Yeah, I'm excited about um, where the research is going with this. I have a friend that's actually done um, MDA, MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD and has had significant benefits Ooh, from it. I love that. Um, but yeah, it's it's really interesting. And I mean, Justin, you already alluded to this. Like, it, it's dosed in a specific way. You're with like a specific person, so this is not just like recreational drug use. No. And um, I mean, I think it can have real benefits, especially for people. I know we talked a lot about depression that ha their depression hasn't responded to traditional mm. like pharmacological treatments, talk therapy. We'll get into other treatments as well. Um, I'm excited to see where this all goes. And I know we'll get more in depth with all these different substances and treatments, but I think one real cool aspect, again, I know I'm all about the psilocybin, is it seems to be completely non-addictive, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. based yeah. on all the research and information we have. And so a lot of people, because that's a real concern of like, well, you know, if – if someone starts using LSD, they have long-term side effects. Do they crave it? Psilocybin seems to not have any of those components to it, which That's is great. what we kind of look for with yeah. any any sort of substance you're regularly going to put in your body, or even if it's one-time use and it's causing all this activation is like, well, what are the ramifications? So far, mm -hmm. psilocybin looks great. That's awesome. Wasn't there a Netflix series on that too? I can't remember. Um yes. And that and changed I'm, my view completely. I, I can't remember if it's on Netflix or Hulu, but um, just looking at how far the research has come and then with the whole war on drugs, when you mentioned that, mm -hmm, Justin, it got mm -hmm. me thinking about how that may have stopped some of the research. And now, you know, I'm really glad that it's popped back up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All I can tell you, I can't remember the name of it. It has yeah. mushrooms on the photo on Netflix. Yes. Yeah. There's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a bunch of yeah. mushrooms growing. You'll see it. It's good. It's good. Yeah. So the next treatment we're going to talk about is ketamine. I'll take it. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Really quick question for both of you. When you think about ketamine outside of mental health, like what are your preconceived notions about it um, before you learn that it's maybe like an alternative treatment? Any any thoughts? We use ketamine a lot in the hospital for pain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I actually one. interact with ketamine quite frequently, but it's not for – I mean, I don't. Like, I'm not dosing the ketamine. Jess is on ketamine right now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I have <laughs> – Probably at least one patient a week that is on IV ketamine for pain wow. in the hospital. So, yeah. That's good. So, I'm used to it for pain management. I love it. I love it. Justin, what can, about you? Can, any, any thoughts? Yeah, ketamine is something I, I know almost nothing about. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm excited to hear, gain any information because it's, it's not something I'm familiar with. Yeah. Totally. Let's dive in. Um, so according to the DEA, ketamine is a disassociative anesthetic that has some hallucinogenic effects. So basically it causes somewhat of a sedation state. So feeling calm and relaxed, um, you could have a lot of relief from pain. And then for some people it causes immobility. So when you are taking ketamine, you'll probably notice that your body movements are a little different. You might feel more calm physically too. So it's a disassociative drug, which means it acts on different chemicals in the brain to reduce or to produce visual and auditory distortion. You might be a little detached from reality. And I know when I say that, people might think like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to go into another vortex. And uh, when we're doing it for mental health reasons, um, it's dosed in a different way. So it's not like you're just taking this stuff when you're tripping. Um, there's, it's regulated in many ways. Um, but the history of ketamine was actually really interesting. So when I was when I was researching about this, it actually originated in Belgium in the 1960s, and it was used as an anesthetic for animals. And then in the 70s, the FDA approved it for anesthetic for people, and they actually used it in the Vietnam War. I worked at the VA. I had no idea about this. Um, wow. Yeah, I had no clue. 
So what it's used for is mostly treatment resistant depression, pain management, and sometimes as a recreational drug for purposes of the podcast of this podcast, we're not going to talk about its recreational use <laughs> just for mental health. Um, but I wanted to yeah, throw that in there. Work, um, yeah, yeah. I wanted to throw that in there that some people might hear ketamine and say, oh, I've done that as like, you know, a recreational drug. And, you know, mm-hmm. for here, I'm just going to talk about the research as it relates to mental health. But so it's approved for um, an injectable short acting, and it's actually called Spravato, and that's the um, the FDA approved version. Um, there's also a nasal spray as well. And um, basically, what happens when people use ketamine is they go to the doctor's office, and the doctor, or you know, there's a person there, a med- med- medical or mental health professional, who watches over the person for about two hours after their dose. So they usually either get a nasal spray or the injectable for one to four weeks. It's pretty short. Um, And then once a week for five to nine weeks, and then, you know, it tapers from there. And I thought it was really interesting because when you think about going to therapy, right, if you go to in-person therapy, you're technically going to a doctor's office or your therapist and you're coming home. Um, This is just a little bit of a longer experience, like a two-hour thing. Um, In terms of benefits, There's a lot of research out there that's still novel novel research, of course, but there's a lot of studies that have shown ketamine to be helpful and effective for treatment-resistant depression, kind of like what Justin and Jess were saying before about like, hey, if other treatment modalities have not worked, then this might be viable for someone who is still experiencing depression and other things haven't worked. Um, But we still need more studies to see if these effects are long-lasting. A lot of the research that I found was people felt really, really, really good for a couple of days and not good in terms of like, oh my gosh, I'm rainbows and butterflies, but good in the sense that depression wasn't impairing their functioning. Like they were able to see Mm. friends, go to work, you know, those things. Um, The thing that I was realizing as I was reading all these studies was we need more research in terms of the dosing, in terms of really looking at the frequency of ketamine administration, Mm -hmm. the route of administration, because you know there's two different ones, the nasal and the injectable. Um, And I think it's really helpful if we could learn more about people's depression from a subjective standpoint too, um, and really see if ketamine helps, you know, because I know sometimes when we're looking at research, we're looking at um, questionnaires and objective measures of depression and things like that. And I would love to hear more from patients who have experienced ketamine, you know, like just like you said, you're in the hospital and stuff. So I'd be really interested to see more of that. Um, And in terms of the negatives, I always like to look at the risks and the benefits. Like as psychologists, we always talk about like, what are the risks and benefits? And really, um, there's no major, major negative side effects to ketamine unless you're uh, doing it as a recreational drug without your doctor's supervision. So Mm -hmm. if you're out there just in the wild doing ketamine, that's probably not advisable. <laughs> so um, when it's used for depression, it's um, it's dosed based on your weight, your sex assigned at birth. And um, if you are taking other medications, that's what your doctor also looks at. So it is promising people who um, have taken ketamine you know, just from the research that I've, that I've looked at, they had a lot of lower, um, a lower subjective rates of depression right after. And then with a couple of days following, and I always think of it like, okay, we want more, you know, we want to just be cured of depression. You know, we don't want it to be long lasting, but if you have treatment resistant depression, that's a really heavy experience. You know, I mean, you've tried everything and even just to get a couple of days of relief in my mind is a win. Um, but I want to hear your thoughts too on, on what you might think about ketamine. If just say one of your clients was taking it, you know? Yeah. I, I really like the point that you made is like, where are they getting it? Who are they getting mm-hmm. it by? Which is is a problem. I know mm-hmm. we're going to get into this later, but is a problem mm-hmm. with a lot of substances in general when you're not getting it from a lab, you're not getting it from a source. Like you don't know what you have. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm laughing a little bit because I just read an article about how melatonin has like unreal levels, <laughs> like in some gummies that are really messing people up. So you weren't actually getting what you thought. But it just goes to show like a lot of things like this. It's like, it's not the substance itself. It's how it's used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And it's, that's why research is so important. That's why we all should be interested in researching any, there shouldn't be a substance that we're like, nope, we're not going to look into that. Cause how do we know when you get into dosages and all the things at what dose, at what level, at what Mm -hmm. frequency could it be helpful? Yeah. No, I learned a lot from you, K10. Like, like I said, I've seen the significant benefits for pain, 
Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes I have wondered because I knew like ketamine worked on um, depression, um, specifically resistant or yeah, treatment resistant depression. So sometimes I'm like, I wonder if this is helping my patient's mood. But obviously, like that's not what I'm assessing and dosing will be um, different. But like I, like I said earlier, I think if I had a client, granted. I don't know, and I don't know if you came across this. Is ketamine only approved in eighteen plus at this point? Probably. That's I'm assuming. that's all I've seen. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. and it depends on. I think it also depends on. Um, I don't know if it's state by state or what, but I noticed a lot. Like some research only had injectables, some research only had yeah. nasal. And I'll be honest with our group members, I really don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really know which one is FDA approved. I'm pretty sure it's the injectable, but I could be wrong. The nasal um, is FDA approved. The nasal. Actually. Okay. Thanks. I do thanks know that, that randomly. Yeah. 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 Um, That's amazing. But but that, I mean, going back to your question, like if one of my clients wanted, like obviously I work primarily with minors, but it's good to know that there is other options out there, especially FDA approved ones that may benefit them. Oh, yeah. And to Justin's point, if it's in my mind, I, I think if it's FDA approved, then it's super helpful to know what you're getting. You want to know the validity of it. Like, am I getting what they're telling me I'm getting? You know what I mean? So if you're just taking ketamine off, you know, just say a ketamine dealer. I don't know if there's ketamine dealers out there, but just say, (laughs) um, I'm sure they're nice people, you know, and that's great. And you, you really just, they might not even know what's in it, you know? So you always have to be careful. Mm -hmm. So the next thing we were going to talk about is virtual reality. And I'm going to take this one if you (gasps) want to. Cool. Take it. Um, so I'm pretty sure everybody listening knows what VR is. Re- virtual reality is an immersive technology where the user enters a three-dimensional interactive environment. We see this a lot with like video games. But in psychotherapy, VR can be used for mindfulness meditation and stress relaxation through things such as guided imagery, um, with nature scenes. You can get VR using and that has biofeedback. Um, it can also be used for exposure therapy. And this is actually called uh, VRET, so like virtual reality exposure therapy to help those with specific phobias and trauma. So in this sense, oh VR God. allows the patient to experience what scares them, triggers panic, feelings, or anxiety via computer-generated three-dimensional and interactive environment um, where the intensity of the exposure can really be controlled and then the therapist can guide them through the treatments. Um, so, I mean, I think of like fear of an airplane. It's a lot yeah. easier mm-hmm. to wow. get mm-hmm. on an airplane in virtual reality than in real life. Um, so there's been studies on individuals uh, with stress, anxiety, depression, specific phobias, social anxiety, PTSD, eating disorders, ADHD. So it's been looked at in a lot of different populations. And some of the benefits so far, we've seen increased relaxation, reduced anxiety and stress, reduced depression, increased positive affective states, increased positive emotions, increased uh, quality of life, and less disruptive behaviors in those with ADHD. So have you all ever like used VR either for fun or for therapeutic benefit? Yes. Oh my gosh. Have you all ever done Richie's Plank Experience on VR? Oh, no, no. I've seen videos of it, though. Oh, yeah. my goodness. So for listeners who don't know, basically what you do is you go to the top, top of the building and you walk on this plank and you literally feel like you are up there. And I'm kind of afraid of heights. So when I was up there, I was like, felt my body physically like freaking out. But I was just in my living room. It was really weird. Um, but I, I could imagine it being really helpful for <laughs> Um, for exposure therapy. I'm thinking of like me and Justin's needle phobia. I wonder if there's one for that. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's immersive, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it goes back to the power of the visual system. Like the visual system is super powerful. You could be repeating to yourself all you want. Like it's not real, it's not real, it's not real. But like you are going to get exposure benefits from it because it sure mm-hmm. as hell looks it. Yeah. Like, and it's only getting more and more realistic. Like the last time I put on a headset, I was blown away. Like the entire time I was just like, had a huge smile on my face because you're you're just in awe of mm-hmm. how real it's getting with these headsets. So I yeah. I love it. I think in the hierarchy of people working through phobias, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, and going to something K10 did for ketamine, like as for negative side effects, I mean, 
some people with claustrophobia don't want the headset mm. on. And like there's some reports of dizziness, but really um, it's beneficial. And I know like VR headsets are not the cheapest thing, but I'm thinking just like from a therapeutic standpoint, it, I think it would be so worth the money to invest in a VR headset. I don't know how you all feel like to do like mindfulness meditation or exposure therapy. They have a bunch of cool apps. I don't know if mm-hmm. y'all have a headset, but um, I was having like a really bad day a couple of months ago and I put it on and like Justin said, it is totally immersive. It's not like you're looking at a screen, like you're in another world. Like you just mm-hmm. 360 view. It's like so wild. And then for a couple of minutes, you just, you meditate. It's really, yeah. really cool. Yeah. So Justin, you kept bringing up things that aren't real, aren't real. So the next thing we're going to talk about is AI. <laughs> Yeah. Justin I pass this one to you because Justin is so passionate about AI. <laughs> this is the part where I reveal myself. I am chat BPT this whole episode. I am not Justin. No, I'm I'm so interested in this topic because AI, y'all don't need me to tell you, it's everywhere right now. Mm-hmm. It's infiltrating like schools writing papers for, for college high school students. We were joking before we hit record of whose dissertation is about to be <laughs> written <laughs> by AI soon. Yeah. But I was shocked, yo, like when I was doing the research on this, how many different people are trying to corner the market and how many different mental health AI-driven apps and products there are. There are so many. I thought there might be a couple. Yeah. Yeah. Well over 10. Like there were tons. Wow. So the two I want to talk to you about real quick, one's called Wysa, W-Y-S-A. So basically it's it's got high reviews. Um, it's basically doing CBT activities and you chat back and forth with this AI bot that is basically programmed to have all these different cognitive behavioral techniques that it will work through with you based on your symptoms, based on how you're feeling, based on what you're experiencing. Um, and you can chat with it whenever you want, 24 hours a day. And it, it basically has programmed all these more structured kind of intervention points to do. Mm-hmm. Seems pretty cool, like interesting. <laughs> um, the oh, I was reading one more point I wrote there. Yep, um, another one called Wobot W O E B O T. Their whole motto is small chats for big feelings. This one felt like it's so cute. Into- I, like that. I was yeah, literally like, like Whoa, right. is me. Whoa, okay. Whoa, <laughs> you got two new investors right here. Wobot. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but Wobot felt like it was like getting therapeutic. Like it basically has CBT, interpersonal therapy, DBT. I want to say I read something that had a little bit of act. Maybe that's not right. But anyways, 91% user satisfaction. But you are just chatting back and forth. It also has some interventions like that are a little uh, cognitive behavioral that you can like work through. But it's anytime you want, you open up the app, you chat with it. And you're just back and forth with this AI that's helping you with your mental health. That is so wild. I have so many feelings about this. <laughs> but to be honest, like, and I'm just being transparent to our listeners, I feel like it's got to be something you would have to try to like understand because yeah. I'm so skeptical. But I also yeah. have never tried because in my mind, I'm like, what's this robot going to tell me? What's yeah. this robot going <laughs> right. to tell me yeah. about the life? of just, you know what I mean? Like these are the thoughts going through my head, but I want to hear your thoughts. Oh my God. I (laughs) I feel the same. I I have so many thoughts, but I I feel the same way. I basically, in a nutshell, I think it could be used as like a really helpful adjunctive, meaning like Mm -hmm. an additional treatment potentially. And then even using the word treatment feels weird because it's a robot. It's like, I, I don't know. It's almost like going to the bar and having a robot make your drink, do you call them a bartender? No, they're a robot. Like it it just (laughs) feels weird. Like it just feels off. But what if that robot makes really good drinks? Cool. Then I'm (laughs) going to call it a bartender. I I mean, I don't know, but I I sometimes think about, yeah, I think about the therapeutic alliance and how, I don't know, I feel like that part might be missing of like Mm -hmm. feeling like somebody truly gets you. But then again, it's like, like you said, you got to try it. What if the robot really gets us? What if they what if know? What if Wobots <laughs> out here? We're not even <laughs> Wobots sponsor us. How much we're picking them? Oh 
Wobot's Throw listening. Five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Buy some coffee, Wobot. But what if yeah. Wobot just like got it? Like Wobot yeah. is like Carl Rogers. You know what I mean? It just sinks into it. I don't Humanistic. know. Well, if you think about it, ChatGPT takes information from the entire internet, right? Like, mm-hmm. if I, I, I'm dumbing this down because I don't know that much about it. So I would imagine that these mental health AI platforms might be able to download the CBT yeah. manual. I'm thinking of CBTI, like for insomnia. If you download that manual, you're able to do like all the math, cal- math calculations of somebody's sleep diary in real time. How much quicker are you going to get better? Like, that's a plus, I think. But then I'm like, this robot doesn't know how to sleep. Like, I, I don't know. I just, I, I, I have like multiple feelings. I have mixed feelings. Yeah. Like, I'm just like, you don't sleep. You don't get it. Like, you know, yeah. I don't know. If the let, la- sorry, go ahead, Jess. Yeah. No, I was just going to say like, so at first, Justin, when you were talking about AI, I was like, yeah, no, and whatever. But when you were talking about 24 hours, like going back to what K10 said about like adjunctive treatment, you mm-hmm. know, I could see how it could be helpful. Say somebody was in therapy, um, you know, you hear all the time that like crisis hotlines, suicide hotlines, mm. put you on weight, mm. like maybe people don't want to talk on the phone. They could chat with this AI bot. Um, I also think like therapy aside that AI could really help with like connecting to resources or dissemination mm-hmm. of mental health information yeah. or like totally. kind of do screenings. Yeah, totally. Like, you oh, know, yeah. somebody's feeling suicidal answer these questions. Okay. You're high risk. Let's hear some resources for you. You're moderate. Like that's how I kind of see AI. AI for triage. What? AI for triage. Yeah. AI for triage. But this is me saying this, never using any of these apps. I know. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. And and there's still a part of me because like if you're a therapist, you work with individuals, you'll know like the uniqueness of the person in front of you mm-hmm. dictates so much about oh, yeah. what you're going to do. And that's the part I'm most skeptical about AI. Yeah. Like someone could be like, anxiety, I'm scared of this. I worry about X. But mm-hmm. like without the cultural, the family, the ba- the the background, like I'm like, that's where I get a little bit of like, can AI do that? There's no way it can now. Will it someday? Maybe. But that's a whole other conversation. That's wild. No, you're right. I could talk about this forever, but I'm thinking of the movie Ex Machina and I'm just oh. thinking about like oh. if she was a therapist, like what? Oh. Like I I got to stop. That, yep. All I'll say, I'm no spoiler, but that movie kept me up. I, oh my gosh. I still think about I, that movie. Me Ooh. too. <laughs> so since we can talk about this forever, I'm going to I'm going to move move us along onto yeah, our please. next thing that we said we were going to talk about, which is TMS, uh transcranial magnetic stimulation. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll do it. Yeah. So TMS basically uses magnetic fields to stimulate nerve cells in the brain to improve symptoms of notably depression. So I, when I was researching this, I kept thinking, for some reason, I kept thinking of ECT and I'm a... Mm -hmm. I'm just going to bring it up how they're different. Um, Mm -hmm. ECT uses electric currents to induce somewhat of a seizure for the person and TMS pulses to stimulate the brain through a magnetic mechanism. So ECT is usually administered in hospitals. You have to like, Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you have to go under anesthesia. I don't know for sure if either of you know. I don't Um, don't know off the top of my head. Me neither. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you have to stay in the hospital. Um, It's like an inpatient thing. And then TMS or yeah, TMS is offered as an outpatient procedure. Like you could go to your doctor's office and leave same day, kind of like ketamine. Um, and what it's used for mostly depression when other treatments haven't been so effective, kind of like what we've been talking about the whole time. The FDA also approved it for OCD migraines and with smoking cessation. I thought that was really interesting. Um, so, and that's only if other treatments haven't been so super helpful or effective. Um, and the one thing that I was reading about was you could also do RTMS, which the R stands for repetitive and for depression, the coil is placed against the scalp of your head. The coil delivers magnetic pulses um, to a certain region of of your brain involved in mood control and depression, kind of like what Justin was saying before about the amygdala with MDMA. And it's thought to activate regions of the brain that have decreased activity during depression. So really what TMS does is it looks at your brain basically and it like pulses to certain parts of the brain that may impact depression. And then mostly 
it's mostly TMS, but I also read about deep TMS. So the difference between repetitive TMS, which is doing TMS, but repetitively, like multiple times within one sitting. Deep TMS basically has to do with the coil that's used. So if any of our listeners go and research this, deep TMS st- uh, stimulates deeper and wider parts of the brain. So it's basically mm. just like more of a treatment, you know? Um, so instead of getting an appetizer, you get a whole entree sort of thing. Um, and then when I was looking at benefits, I found a meta-analysis. Um, there was 27 randomized um, control trials and there was about 1,200 depressed yeah. I, I was like, whoa, 1,200 depressed patients. And it it showed that TMS was mostly effective and it really, really focused on depression. I would love to see OCD and migraines and smoking right. cessation because I know that that would be helpful for some people. But just like the other ones, we need a lot more research. Um, I'd love to know more about the mechanism, mechanism of action. That's what a lot of the researchers were talking about. Like They know that it helps, but they and they kind of have an idea of why it helps, but they can't pinpoint it for sure. Um, so that was a little unclear. And if either of you know, you can enlighten me, but that's just what I what I read. And to my knowledge, at the re- time that we're recording, I haven't seen any serious side effects of TMS. Um, and then again, I don't really know much about it. But when I was researching it, it seemed pretty promising um, and a lot less invasive than ECT or those other treatments that um, really, really might like put somebody out for a little bit. So I did a quick Google search. So ECT yeah. can be done inpatient or outpatient. It's Oh, it can. Oh, I didn't Thanks know for so, doing that. Yeah. I didn't know that either. Yeah. yeah no, that's so great, apparently it's more often done inpatient if like high risk mm-hmm. of suicidality to okay. keep the person safe. Um, but that it can sense. be done outpatient. It was interesting. Like when I first Googled MUSC, because this is Google is creepy, is one of the big hospitals in South Carolina. So – it came up and it was like primarily outpatient. And the next resource was from the UK that said primarily inpatient. <laughs> um, but it can be done both, <laughs> apparently. Nice. Um, nice. Thanks for researching that. No yeah. problem. I don't know much about TMS, so I learned a lot from you. I think it sounds like it's a good option instead of ECT because I know like just from graduate school and mm. stuff, ECT, you know, even though it was really effective, you would hear stories mm-hmm. about people like losing memory or things mm-hmm. like yeah. that. Um so yeah, I'm excited to learn more about TMS. Yeah, I, I thought it, I was surprised that they were able to do a meta analysis with 27. Mm-hmm. Me uh, too. I linked it. Yeah. So in case you want to read it, it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's because w- when you get the scale that big, that's when you're like, okay, if you're if you can combine and do the meta analysis and you see it's mostly effective, you're like, oh. I, I'm surprised. I haven't yeah. heard more about this or that's more out there. For depression, I know you said mm-hmm. we need to expand, but. Yeah. Because, yeah, I'm thinking of the difference. My my grandmother actually had ECT treatments and, oh my oh, gosh, wow. the amnesia that she experienced and yeah. um, just the amount of like, she was just down and out for days after that. Yeah. So if this was available yeah. for her at the time back then, I mean, 60s, that would be great. But um, it sounds way less invasive. And yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's just really interesting how – these new research, um, I don't know, just these treatments can come to the forefront and do a meta-analysis. And it's just like, wow, now we have a lot more research than we thought mm-hmm. we did, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. The mechanism, under, learning what the mechanism is that's changing or like creating the change reminds me a lot of the next topic, <gasps> EMDR, <laughs> which is also like what – What's the mechanism here? Because something's happening, something's mm-hmm. working. But anyways, who would like to tell us all about EMDR? Yeah, I'll talk about EMDR and I'll kind of lump EMDR and brain spotting together because they're similar yet different. So EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing, hence why we call it EMDR because that's a mouthful, um, is really a trauma-focused psychotherapy. And I think it's so interesting because it was actually developed in the 80s, but I feel like in the past like five to 10 years, it's really become much more popular. Um, So EMDR follows an eight-phase protocol guided by the Adaptive Information Processing or AIP model which proposes that traumatic experiences may be inadequately processed at the time of the incident or incidents, resulting in dysfunctional information processing, which in turn may lead to symptoms of PTSD. So the therapy using uses the technique of bilateral stimulation and is designed to activate the information processing system. So it's thought 
um, to allow traumatic memories to be reprocessed and stored adaptively, enabling new learning to occur, in turn reducing stress and forming new cognitive understanding of events. Um, so it was really developed for PTSD and trauma, but has since been extended to those experiencing trauma-related symptoms with comorbid severe mental illness, such as psychosis, which I didn't know until I looked up some information on this. Um, wow. It's also been examined in people with depression and bipolar disorder. And really the main outcome of EMDR so far has been PTSD symptoms. Mm. Um and the reason I want to talk about EMDR and brain spotting, because a lot of people have heard of EMDR, but not necessarily brain spotting. And brain spotting is newer. It was developed in 2003 and has similarities to EMDR. However, a key difference is that brain spotting requires attentional control while attending to a specific spot within mm. the visual field that is linked to wow. heightened physical sensations while you are recollecting a traumatic memory. So the brain spot is a physiological subsystem in the body and nervous system that serves as really an entry point where trauma, emotional stress, habits, repetitive patterns, sensory experiences, et cetera, hold emotional experience and sensory mm. memory for. So the thought behind brain spotting is by accessing the brain spot, it recruits the superior colliculi and brainstem to allow activation to be processed and integrated. So in both of these types of therapies, it's a reintegration. Um, brain spotting is primarily used for trauma and anxiety related disorders, as well as depression and chronic pain. And with brain spotting research so far has seen reduced PTSD symptoms. Um, so less intrusion, um, less reported stress, um, increased self-regulation, um, as well as less pain and chronic pain, better sleep, there you go, K10, um, increased energy, reduced anxiety, things like that. So, so yeah. Wild. Have either of you like done EMDR, brain spotting training either? So, so I did uh, ACT, uh, Accelerated Resolution Therapy, which is very, very, very similar to EMDR. It's a little more gestalty, but it was like created as an offshoot off of EMDR. So it has um, the same eye movements, a lot of the same things. And I, I, I was a personal testimony that like going through the training, like we had to think of a trauma, like, and I mm -hmm. thought of one of my biggest traumas I've been through. And I was dumbfounded. Like mm -hmm. I was literally, I could not believe because afterwards, like I'm a big skeptic. I think that's why I love research. But afterwards, I was actively pulling the imagery that was so disturbing to me before. And it's like, I could not get disturbed. Like I, I wasn't wow, getting the wow. same reaction. And again, everyone can have different experiences with things. We know this is generally true in psychotherapy, but I was definitely a believer. Like I was like, mm -hmm. whoa, like this, these memories, these images have haunted me. And now it's like, I'm seeing them in my mind and not feeling the same about them. That is incredible. Oh my God. Yeah, I, I've, I'm not EMDR trained um, and I'm not trained in brace spotting either and I haven't done either of them. I've had clients who have came to me for sleep stuff, you know, who have done these in the past. And they've at least told me that um, with EMDR and brain spotting, actually, Jess, I'm happy you brought up the sleep thing that they have slept so much better. And I wonder mm -hmm. if it's because like Justin's saying, I mean, you're processing it in, in a different way and you're not as disturbed. I mean, I love, I love how you describe that. I, I want to learn more about it. It's amazing. Yeah. I had uh, Tina Clark, the, the therapy oh, studio on my podcast and Tina. she talked about brain spotting and she did a, a brain spotting activity on me during the podcast. And I was such a skeptic and I was like, and this is over like video, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And she was like, we're doing this on the podcast. So don't like dive into your deepest trauma ever. It was wild. Like I literally right. felt my eyes like – it's on YouTube. But like like Justin, I was a skeptic and after it, I was like, what? Yeah. I'm going to try this. Like I, I, just, I don't Tina. understand. I don't understand yeah. how that worked. But something happened and I feel different. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's incredible. And it, it does. It goes back to like everything's connected. So the visual cortex and the visual system is so powerful that if you can disrupt – the visual system while activating these memories, 
it's doing something to how you reconsolidate and understand and look at that memory. It doesn't change what's happened, but it changes your feeling and connection to it, which is just mm -hmm. like wild. Like we are neuro hacking in different ways now, but it's, I, I get real into this because of course I'm big into yoga. We know there's great mm -hmm. studies that compare like yoga to psychotherapy for a lot of different mental health outcomes and my yoga instructor was always like, the issues are in your tissues, which it's why <laughs> it's like, why I would massage it. that? Why? Yeah. It's such a good saying. Why would like practicing yoga or doing massage therapy, why would that help with your mental health? Cause it's all connected. Like yes. the way, and we don't have a great understanding of how we store pain or how we like, again, hold on to trauma, but we're starting to learn different mechanisms to untangle and have a mm. new relationship with them. That's why this is so fascinating and interesting. You know what else is fascinating and interesting? Yo, it's, oh my God, that was <laughs> the so Google good. Scholar shorts. The, the Google Scholar shorts. I, I'm <laughs> glad you left it on that because my transition otherwise was like, we've been talking about research, let's talk about more. Um, so <laughs> that was much better. <laughs> we've already discussed a variety of novel treatment interventions for mental health, especially depression. Like a lot of the things we talked mm. about were for depression, like ketamine, psychedelics, TMS. But what if I told you we have even more novel interventions for depression? Any guesses? Give them to me. Any okay. guesses on what some might be? <laughs> I, I, I want like video game playing how about that yeah oh online gaming okay that was not included in this study oh. but Damn. i mean maybe <laughs> maybe um so marwaha and colleagues in 2023 reviewed novel and emerging biological treatments for major depressive disorder and so i'm just going to highlight some of the ones that we haven't talked about so far so other types of brain stimulation including transcranial direct current stimulation or TDSC. And that's been shown to be significantly better than a sham treatment um, in terms of response as well as remission. GABA inhibitors, mm. um, which when given in an infusion led to rapid reduction in anxiety and depression, specifically with postpartum depression, which I thought oh. was really cool. And then anti-inflammatory agents can help um, reduce depressive symptoms. Really? That last one I knew because you I'm, did? you know, I'm, I'm big into that. Oh, I'm yeah. into anything to reduce inflammation. Yeah, the, the correlative, I can't say the word apparently, research on inflammation and mm -hmm. mental health is like through the moon. Like if you're, so many things correlate high with high inflammation, but if you can reduce inflammation in the body generally, it, it feels like it helps with almost everything. Yeah. I could see that though. Like, like now that I'm actually thinking about it, I'm even thinking like the food you eat, the, mm -hmm. the just everything. If you know what I mean? If you're, and I'm dumbing this down, but if you're literally inflamed, then your body is just not operating the same way either. You know, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. You said that wow. way better than my sleep deprived brain. <laughs> no, you had, like, I, I no, you described it really well and I'm just no, taking I a didn't. guess. <laughs> no, I really didn't. As of all night editing my Star Wars video, and I feel like you know when you're sleep deprived, yeah, <laughs> and there's like the wheels like don't turn over. That's my brain. Oh no, yeah, yeah. That. That's it's like 100. Like the wheels are actually not round; they're squares, and you're trying to like no, push it's the like, car along. It's like <laughs> it's tough. It's just tough. Clunk, clunk, clunk. Yeah. But those are so interesting. But yeah, I'm I've been interested in inflammation for a while, especially having Chiari. And having my brain not fit in my skull, you can Google that or we'll talk about it in another episode. But reducing inflammation is really important to me. But I think we should be, there's this episode has made me excited. Me too. Like it's made me just feel like excited and optimistic about going forward. Like we're getting these cool novel treatments and we're deep into the research. Like we're, we're just going to learn so much more. I can't wait. You know what I can't wait for? <laughs> the polls. <laughs> the polls. Y'all, thank you so much for your participation, as always, in the polls. Gosh, it's a good time. We just, we just get curious. We love data. We love research. We get lucky. We get these large sample sizes. Like, we get how many people respond to this? Like, they're in the hundreds. Like, hundreds awesome. and hundreds. Like, it's cracking over a thousand total. 
participate in these polls. I think that's pretty cool. First question. Would you consider using psychedelics for mental health benefit? Absolutely. Possibly. But I have concerns or no way. What do you think our listeners were feeling? The middle. Totally. 49%. Possibly. But I have concerns. Well, I think that's a smart mindset. 49% people. 29% said absolutely. Maybe they've been absorbing some of that research or they're just, just, ready to jump in 21 percent said no way on the psychedelics they're not not even then next question would you consider virtual reality to improve your mental health uh absolutely possibly but i have concerns or no way i'm gonna go middle I, I wanna, again i, yeah, I don't too. know if that's a cop I, feel out. Like, <laughs> I feel like that's that's the highest do you think it's Higher or lower than the psychedelics? This is a trick question. Oh, I think it's lower. I think more people would be confident about virtual reality than psychedelics, but I still think think people have concerns. 48% of people. That was so close. It's about the the same numbers. It's 48% would possibly, but I have concerns. 28% said absolutely so one notch less than psychedelics and 25 percent said no way so about the same wow about the same. maybe we're just getting at personality characteristics here <laughs> oh my <laughs> that's, that's really interesting seeking novel treatments is the characteristic we're tapping into next question have you or someone you know used emdr or brain spotting yes i'm not sure or nope I feel like yes. I, I feel I, like I our group yes, members yeah. Yeah. know somebody. Yes. Yeah. 58%. Wow. 58%. Dang. Yeah. Our listeners. 30% said nope. 12% not sure. But yeah, the majority. Majority of people know, know someone or they have used EMDR or brain spotting. This was a fun question here. I, you know, I got excited about this one. What are your thoughts on AI therapists or mental health helpers? Oh my god, Let's I'm see so here. excited! I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> wait a second, it switched on me. Sorry about that. Here we go. <laughs> the first response that popped up: No, <laughs> just, just no. <laughs> they didn't expand. They just said no. Another person right below that: Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> um, <laughs> dot dot dot. I have concerns. <laughs> Someone said that's a really good way to continue isolating. <laughs> Hard pass. Oh, I'm, wow. I'm, someone said stupid. Hundred percent no. Okay, wow. all right. Well, it seems like people are on the fence a little bit. <laughs> someone said no effing way. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but th- okay, here we go. Someone said computers can't generate a genuine uh, empathy empathetic response okay Okay. yeah i could and they don't sleep (laughs) sk10 well i guess computers do go to sleep technically (laughs) have have you guys ever oh go ahead go ahead i was like i wish i could read all the unique ways people said no (laughs) (laughs) were there any responses that were not no yeah that Uh, through. the closest we got here is honestly i haven't researched the topic enough to know (laughs) All the rest are red flags. Hashtag no thank you. Horrible idea. I love it. That's hilarious. We we love those responses. All right, and here's another one. What new treatments in mental health are you excited about? Because apparently it's not. (laughs) Not not, AI. It's not AI. (laughs) Not AI. All right, done. More neuroscience. I'm into that. Someone put here psychedelics. Okay. Nice. Shrooms. Neurofeedback. Mm-hmm. Let's see. A lot of people. Oh, internal family systems. That's a hot psychotherapy yeah, these it days. Is. Ketamine. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people into the neurofeedback, neuroscience. L- love your responses. Love that. Interesting. Technology is coming for us, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, the tech part is just, it's going to get more and more integrated. I don't think there's any way getting around that. You already also, I just can't, I can't stop. <laughs> I just can't stop thinking about everybody's responses to the AI thing. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> like, nope, nope. But know what people say yes to. 
our group member questions. <laughs> they do. Every yeah. episode. Every up. So so KBI was supposed to do this section, so we all just want to like kind of popcorn them, just pick out yeah. some questions we, we like. Okay. Well, let's start with Lily, um, who did not put where she is from. Lily asks, are there new things for trauma therapy or people who have dealt with stuff for years that got chronic? We kind of already answered this, but. Yeah, Lily's touching on like the treatment resistant, Mm -hmm. you know, experiences. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on what it would be, like what trauma it would be and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. But I would imagine that even, I mean, EMDR isn't like super, super old either, you know? Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. That was the first thing I thought of, but we already talked about that one. MDMA. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking EMDR, ART, brain spotting. Um, I, it just in general, I think it's a cool novel novel within the area of psychotherapy and mental health of integrating the visual system that's going to be different than a more narrative or sort of cognitive approach which brings up exposure of like talking about the event, talking about what occurred. It's something I think you just got to try. I I think even if you, we sat here and described the exact, all the details, I know just went over some of them. You you would be like us and be like a little skeptical. I think it's worth trying. I have not heard anyone that's had, I've heard some people be like, you know, it wasn't for me. It wasn't very effective. I haven't heard a lot of like negative in terms of like, Mm -hmm. I hated it. Like Mm -hmm. it was Mm -hmm. damaging in any way. I just, you know, anything can happen, but I think those responses, if there were a lot more of those, I'd be like, I don't know if I'd recommend it, but I'm excited about EMDR brain spotting and and understanding it outside the lens of trauma within other things. Me too. Who wants to take the next question? <laughs> me <laughs> i don't know how we're choosing so <laughs> robin good old Ro- robin how are you let's just start with that robin out in iowa with all the corn oh that's nebraska <laughs> but iowa too i'm from ohio we have some corn not as much what? i dissociated during emdr Ooh, let's get into this Ooh. Why does this happen to some people and not to others? This is a really good question, Robin. Does this mean I should never attempt EMDR again? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, great question here. It's a really good one. Well, we know dissociation can be a trauma response. Um, so I would imagine since EMDR is a trauma treatment, as you're asked to recall your trauma, your body may be protecting your, mm. yourself from your trauma by dissociating. Um, and I, I do know because I was doing some literature review f- for this that it is possible to do EMDR even if you dissociate. So going mm-hmm. to your question like should mm-hmm. I never attempt EMDR again, my recommendation would be to talk with wh- your therapist who is providing EMDR directly to determine like what would be best for you. Is this the safest? Do you feel safe? doing EMDR? Is this the most effective? Do you need to work through some things before attempting EMDR? Um, But I don't think it means necessarily you should never attempt it again. Yeah. I even think about like, and I don't know much about EMDR, Robin. I'm I'm just thinking from like almost like a lay person view at this point. If you're trying something new too and disassociation is a trauma response. Like Jess said, it it could just be maybe one of the side effects. I don't really know for sure, but I would imagine that who knows, you know, maybe it's just one of those things, but I don't, I've heard of other people um, that have disassociated during EMDR. One of my close friends did, and I, we just don't know why she did. And she was like, she went back and she was fine, but that's just her experience. Yeah. I just to echo everything that's been said and going through the ART training, I, I wouldn't rule it out as a possibility. You know, it's hard to get into your exact unique situation and circumstances, but would I tell someone who dissociated in EMDR or ART style treatment not to go back? No, I definitely, I wouldn't jump to, oh, it's not the right treatment. You shouldn't go. I would say 
yeah, people can dissociate in almost any style psychotherapy. Yeah, that's what I was it's, thinking. It's just a possibility. To me as a therapist, if someone – if and when someone begins dissociating in session, I'm not surprised by that. I'm curious. What were the trigger points? What led to it? But it's something that happens in psychotherapy. How you come back from it, what may happen next time, those, again, all need to be answered and explored. Totally. All right. The next question, Eleni from New Jersey. I'm from there originally. Um, only if you're central Jersey though, I'm joking. Um, what are your thoughts on DBT yeah. therapy? Yeah. There's like, <laughs> um, so DBT therapy, I know, um, we've talked about DBT in the past and we had, um, Dr. Courtney Tracy on here to talk about it too, but what are, what's y'all thoughts on it? I mean, I'm not formally DBT trained, but I definitely think it can be very effective. I know it was developed originally for borderline personality disorder, but I mean, it has been adapted for so many different conditions and I have heard so many benefits. I don't provide it, um, but I have clients that, and I think I've mentioned this on a past episode, that if I'm working with them on one thing, they might have a DBT therapist working on something um, specific. So I definitely think it works for certain people if they buy into it and they want to use the skills. Um, yeah. Nice. Also not DBT trained, uh, but a research supported treatment. And yeah. I did flip through the giant binder. <laughs> I got to spend a few days going through the giant, giant binder. And I was impressed with the diversity of interventions in there. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's mindfulness based. That's why a DBT therapist was like, yo, you should check this out. Like you're all into mindfulness and regulation. DBT incorporates a lot of that in pretty seamlessly. And I going through the activities and the things they do, this was for a DBT group. I was like, oh, this seems really cool. And it, I was totally left with, again, no research to back this up, but I was like, this seems like it would be good for anybody. Like some yeah. of these skills and these understanding yourself, the reflection points, the wise mind. Mm -hmm. Like I was like this, I, I was sold on it. But again, haven't gone through any formalized training, just know some of the research. Yeah, it's so robust. I'm DBT trained um, and I led a DBT group. I did DBT consultation, like the formal program and everything like that. And I, at first I was like, it feels like a cult. Um, and then after I got over that, um, I realized how helpful it is for some people. Mm -hmm. And it's not helpful for everybody. But um, I even just the interpersonal effectiveness module of how to set a boundary. Like there's just so many skills in there that could be applicable for so many different people. Um, and I think it's super helpful. The one thing about DBT that I think throws people off a little bit is with the group, how structured it is. Some people don't like mm. that structure, you know? So mm. if you're not like a structured person, you might not love it, but it also might hold you accountable. Who knows? So our next question comes from anonymous from anonymous location. Um, what are the risks and benefits of edible marijuana for anxiety? I've tried it once for a concert and it made me feel normal. Is it something people can rely on too much? Hmm. Hmm. So cannabis, marijuana um, is still technically, I'm pretty sure it's schedule. Is it schedule one still? Um, or is it schedule two? I can't remember. Um, Jess is on it. I see her eyes. Jess light is up. on it. Her, so her Je Jess will lit up so big. She's like, Jess will report back. Um, but um, I did a lot of research about marijuana for the book that I wrote on insomnia, yeah. and I came across a lot about anxiety and depression. And we know, at least this is just from a brief, brief, brief overview. Um, we noticed that if people are taking it every now and then, and they're getting it from you know a medical dispensary, it's dose straight. It's not just from you know, your friend who doesn't know what's in it, like, you know, uh, just so you get it from a legitimate place and you try it at home or, you know, before you go out or whatever, everybody has different responses. Like everybody, I just noticed that like everybody just has a different response. You could take the exact same edible with the exact same level of THC and CBD and CBN, and you might just have a different response. So in my mind, I always say, you know, I'm a harm reductionist. So I'm like, if it helps you and you're not using it all the time, all day, every day for everything. And you're, you know, still using skills. Why not under the supervision of your doctor and all that stuff, of course, but 
you know, if you're having a really good effect from it, it could be helpful. Um, some people report that it helps for that initial anxiety, but if they take too much of it, then they start to have more anxiety. So it just depends on the dosing, I think. And it is schedule one. Um, Thanks, Jess. N- no problem. Um, yeah. And I guess we didn't define what schedule one substance is, but oh, yeah. um, high potential for abuse Mm -hmm. Uh, no currently accepted medical use, but I know marijuana is legal in some areas, but yes. But even, yeah, it's like, (laughs) that's the first thing I think of is the, um, like schedule one is supposed to be no health benefit. Yeah. And it's like marijuana for sure. Pain, glaucoma, like don't come at me. Don't come Mm -hmm. at me. Like with that anxiety, like everything K10 is spot on, like dart in the middle of the board but like when you start talking about like chronic pain you start talking about like glaucoma like mm-hmm. these are things like you can reliably like lean on marijuana again people yeah. can have individual experiences and differences for sure but anxiety anxiety is one of those mixed bags for sure of some people it does significantly make their anxiety worse some people it's better mm-hmm. and we're, we're still collecting the old data and it takes some time because a lot of these things have only been researched in the last few decades. So true. Which some of you might not have even been alive that long, but <laughs> KJ from Minnesota, we have no idea how old they may or may not be, but they ask if someone has had a manic episode, but the depressive lows are more severe than mania. Would psychedelics and or ketamine ever be safe-ish to use? Very great question, KJ. That is a really good one. Just on the research with ketamine, um, you know, bipolar disorder is understudied within the realm of mm-hmm. ketamine, mm-hmm. but there is some some evidence to support its effectiveness um, with a single ketamine infusion for bipolar disorder, including an antidepressant effect and a reduction in suicidal thoughts. So. Based on the research so far, it's believed to work on the depressive pole of the bipolar disorder, um, but there's a risk of switching into a manic state. So um, it re- I think it really just depends. Again, we need more research. Um, mm-hmm. And and same with psychedelics. Um, there have been no completed cl- clinical trials looking at the treatment of bipolar disorder with psychedelics, so it's hard to say it's safety. But based on self-report, psilocybin may... Um, elevate risk of triggering a manic episode, but that risk is not considered strong or overwhelming. And it does show potential beneficial effects on the depressive side. So I think at least based off the research, I know if the substances do help bipolar, it's for the depressive part of bipolar, not the manic part. Love it. Raylan from Minnesota. I'm actually a little nervous for what I think the new stuff is coming out because it seems like manualized treatments and I think knowing something isn't enough. I need you, like the general therapist, to actually understand it, not be able to just do it. Raylan, you literally just talked about what Dr. J talked about before. (laughs) Yo, me me and Raylan were just like twin flame in this one. Exactly. (laughs) I know, exactly. The uniqueness of the individual, right, Raylan? Mm -hmm. Like- that's the thing. I know uh, AI or robot or something manualized, it's taking our general, our general symptoms, which again, that it's not to say that can't be helpful. Oh, we know that can be helpful. Like if we know you meet criteria for depression, well, that's going to help us think of a lot of different treatments that we know in general might help with depression. But practicing psychotherapy, the real nuance and nuts and bolts comes down to for the individual doing the great biopsychosocial, assessing their full history, mm-hmm. that's when you really hone in of what's yeah. going to be good for someone. And do I think good referrals into manualized treatments, maybe manualized groups like DBT? For sure, that happens all the time. But who is assessing on the front end? That's where I get skeptical about AI yeah. a little bit and stuff like that. Who's really connecting with the human here? And I, Clearly, we're not there by the polls. Like, people aren't that interested. No. Yeah. At least they're not listening to this podcast. But I think we're going to get there. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to be that person that's going to be like, we're not going to do it. Not probably in 20, 30 years. But 
our world's going to look so different when AI is to the point where people don't really don't know if they're talking to a human or a robot. Mm -hmm. But today, are we there? I don't think so. Because I know when I pick up that phone and I call and I'm like, representative. Oh rep my God. <laughs> I, I know that shows your core personality with how you say representative after 10 <laughs> minutes of being on hold. It's like representative. Like, it's just like... I, I just want to hear just say representative. What representative? <laughs> representative. She says it just like that. She says it just very politely. She's like, may I please robot speak to a representative? <laughs> please. I would like to speak to a representative. <laughs> So Ray from Canada says, dealing with severe postpartum depression and PTSD, starting TMS next month, looking into ketamine treatments as well. What can I do with my psychologist to help me get the most out of these treatments? EMDR, question mark, safe to do during TMS treatment. Thanks. And then she says, love the podcast, Dr. J. <laughs> We're chopped liver, Jess, and KBI. <laughs> well, Ray. You I mean, Jess is technically Dr. J, so it's me and Kristen who are out of the group. Ray has a Star Wars name. Ray knows I love Star Wars. I mean, me and Ray are just – we vibe like that. I don't know this at all, but thank you, Ray. What what do you all think? I don't know. I go back to it really depends on your goals, and I hate mm. that that's like the typical psychologist answer, but I think talking with – any of uh, any member of your treatment team to kind of see like how could it be helpful what should i focus mm -hmm. on you know um and even just i think what might be useful and helpful for anybody considering any of these treatments is to process with your therapist like your feelings your fears mm -hmm. your anxieties you know um your goals and i think it's always helpful to have somebody on the sideline you know um supporting you through the process too you know Yeah, I, I'm just thinking like I know you said you're starting TMS, you're looking into ketamine, can you do EMDR? Like those are all very different treatments. I mean, I am not your mm -hmm. provider. Personally, I would probably just like focus on one at a time. Um, if you're yeah, starting TMS, that. start with TMS and see how that works for you. And if it doesn't, you know, talk with your psychologist about that and see if there's other treatments that would be helpful or different. Or beneficial. I think that I like that in general for us as humans when we make changes because what I like to do personally, if I'm taking a new supplement, if I'm changing up my bedtime routine, if I'm doing these things, it's really hard to assess the changes or like effectiveness of any one thing we're doing when we're doing six things at once, yeah. like just in yeah. general. Yeah. And so I know all of us want to feel better in, in so many different ways, but you you might actually be able to grow a lot more exactly what Jess said, if you can sort of separate those things out and really see like, oh, when I started TMS, those first three, four weeks, oh my gosh, like this is what I experienced. But if you're doing multiple things at a time, you might not know. So you might be investing in things that just aren't adding much to you. It's kind of exactly. what I like to think about. I try to be my own little researcher in that way. I love that. Okay. Rachel from Colorado. She said, there's an interesting theory out there that says that mental illness, as we know, it will be extinct soon with all the new treatments emerging. I'm curious about what your thoughts are on this. And if you think therapy, if you think therapy will ever cease to exist, also thankful for all of you. Love the podcast. Rachel, thank you for including me in this. Thankful for you as well. Um, <laughs> I'm just sassy. Uh, anyways, um, but what do y'all think? What do y'all think about that theory? Me and Jess are like uh, I, I don't, Justin's glitching. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, I'm no, kidding. Justin, okay. you go because I just am processing my thoughts. I so here's my thought on this, which is like I just had a great conversation about this the other day, which was like opening my mind in different ways. But like, there are benefits to anything we talk about in mental health, like. Mm -hmm. May, okay, I'll draw that back just a little bit. There might be some severe stuff we talk about that maybe the benefits aren't as obvious, but under almost any mental health umbrella, there are sort of like evolutionary or biological reasons 
we can kind of be like, oh, like that can be helpful in these contexts. Like being more hyper vigilant or alert can protect us. Being more anxious and worrying can kind of make us plan forward and anticipate things. We know a lot of very funny, real creative people have depression. It's just real interesting because I'm coming off that conversation I had the other day, which was really eye-opening. I thought it was really cool. And thinking about if you eliminate all aspects of mental health, I think you're going to be eliminating things that are actually helpful to us as well. And we don't always talk about that. We usually talk about just how bad things are because we want to feel better. We want to get better and grow and such. But all of us can reflect on the different struggles we have. And there are aspects of it. It's not saying overall it's a good thing. No, but there's aspects of it that actually add to our life in different ways. So I I just have a tough time seeing that happen, that all these mental health things are gone in a way. Anyways, that was my rambling. I agree with that. I think it's hard to imagine a world without talking about things, without mental health, without, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because I just think it's, I don't know, we're reducing the stigma so much too that I think, I I don't even know if it would cease to exist, like therapy Mm -hmm. in general. Um, But who knows? Maybe AI is going to take over everything and we're just going to be at the mercy of robots. I'm not going to stop thinking about this all night. I know, the robot. You guys should watch Eclectic Dreams. And it's on Amazon Prime. And one, this is not sponsored, by the way. This is just me and my brother's favorite um, series. It's called Eclectic Dreams on Prime. And the name of the episode is called Autofac. It gives like post-apocalyptic Amazon. It's crazy. Um, robots, whatever. Anyway. Yo. It's nuts. It's crazy. Yeah. Juliana. I just jumped to this because this is what my eyeballs are focusing on from Jersey. What's the background check process like for these treatments? Do they consider those with addiction history? Great question. Is it covered by insurance? Well, so I guess background check, like in science, we do randomized control trials. So mm-hmm. like. Explain what that means. <laughs> I, I was about to say, I was like, I guess we have to explain that what that means. Studies where you usually will have a control group, so somebody that is getting a placebo or no treatment at all, somebody getting or a group of people getting the intervention, um, and they don't know most randomized control trials are what we call double blind, meaning the person administering the intervention. Obviously, if it's like EMDR, the person administering the intervention knows. But if we're thinking about like psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine, those type of things. The person administering the treatment doesn't know if they're administering the placebo or the actual intervention. The person receiving it doesn't know, and then they look, measure outcomes. Um, that was a very simple f- version. Y'all can jump in if I That was a beautiful description. There. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's that. Um, with regard to, like, insurance, um, it depends on the treatment. Like EMDR, brain spotting, could be if your provider takes insurance. Um, we kind of touched on this with ketamine, um, the Spravato, which is the nasal spray. I'm pretty sure – I know I already said that confidently, but I'm pretty sure it is. Um, we can look that up if it's not. Um, is the only form of ketamine technically covered by insurance as it is FDA approved? Um, but it may not be depending on the insurance. And then psychedelics are not currently covered Dang. by insurance. Um, MDMA is projected to be the first one covered as it is considered FDA approved for PTSD. Um, Stoked. TMS Excited. may or may not be covered. So it really depends on the treatment. There's so many barriers. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know. Um, okay. Mo from New Jersey and they also put a clown face. I relate to that because I'm from there. And I felt that in my soul. Um, I'm surprised you didn't put a fist pump, Mo. Um, what predictions do you have for how the treatment landscape will evolve in the next five to 10 years? Mo, solid question. Ooh. That's a really good one. I'm, I'm 100% invested in biofeedback. The more we learn about biomarkers related to mental health, cortisol, heart rate, like this is already, the biofeedback world is already booming. So I'm not like blowing your mind here. 
but we're just going to get more and more wearables and trackables mm -hmm. and things that directly relate to our mental health. Like that I think will be really helpful and we'll have to learn our relationship with them. But I see that becoming more and more integrated within therapy, psychotherapy, because so far there's not a lot of those products, but therapy, psychotherapy, mental health has boomed just in the last three years because of COVID and people all of a sudden realizing they have this thing called mental health. So I'm thinking about, yeah, biofeedback wearables and how it's going to become integrated within therapy and mental health. I love that. I even think about, I even think about how wearables just in general, like your Apple watch or like some, like just something as simple as that and how we might use that for sleep. Um, oh. or even just stress, you know, just looking at that. But I guess I don't have any predictions, but I have hopes that insurance companies might change a little bit, um, mm, as a, sure. you know, just to reduce barriers to treatment and help clinicians actually do their job without many barriers. I'm hopeful. Um, I'm really, really hopeful. Cause I think, if you know you have a provider who doesn't take insurance or you have a provider who does take insurance either way you're kind of up against okay i have to submit a claim to insurance to get this yeah. you know covered um either way if you're out of network or in network if you want it covered and i keep thinking about like will we be diagnosing as heavily as we do to appease insurance mm -hmm. companies so these are just random rambling thoughts that i have but i think about that all the time and how that might actually change the accessibility um, and it might actually get people in the therapy room, virtual or in person, a little more. And hopefully that might change the landscape of just, I don't know, our culture and stress and everything else. I'm, I'm hopeful. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up because one thing I hope to see, I don't know if it's a prediction, actually it's semi-based in reality, is um, increasing of telehealth services across state lines. Mm. Because we mm. do know like psychologists have SIPAC. Uh, I know that counseling um inter-counseling compact or something just happened i know social work has like proposed one um because for anybody listening especially if you're not in the united states generally speaking and there are exceptions to this psychologists therapists social workers etc can only practice in the states they're licensed in which means we are limited to our state yeah. unless you have SIPAC, for example, but not all states are in it. Um, and that's only Florida. for psychologists. Yeah, Florida. I think there's like, what, 30-something now. There's 34, uh, I think. Florida's – we're just going to be our own country. I'm not saying I'm for that at all. I'm not. But if one day you just find out and you're like, oh, my gosh, Justin's just stuck in Florida. You know, they revolted. They're their own country now. Just, just remember me. Yeah, or don't we'll remember you. Me. Keep your Thank passport you. just in case, you know, just <laughs> honestly. <laughs> yeah, no, so I, that's a hope I have to increase accessibility. And I truly do think that psychedelics are going to become like more research oh, yeah. totally. and mainstream in five to 10 years. Absolutely. Yeah. That'd be epic. Um, do we have time for one more question? We do. Okay, so this one is from Anonymous, but I'm just punting this straight to K10. What are your Ooh. thoughts on Snapchat's new AI? Because in case anybody doesn't know, K10 is like the Snapchat queen. What? I just have a high Snap score because I talk to all my friends mm -hmm. on Snapchat. I'm not doing anything crazy. You don't talk to me on Snapchat. I know. No, I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I actually view your Snapchat every morning because you Snapchat that right before you work out. At 4, yes. 4 a.m. Yes. And I'm like, That's oh, actually just got to work out in today. That's my after work. Oh, post workout. Excuse me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah. I I have used Snapchat's AI and it's really freaky. Um, so there was this thing going around and it said like, um, it oh the Snapchat AI doesn't know your location, it doesn't know where you are, and I was like, let me just fuck around and ask it, you know, like let me just see if it knows where I am. So I asked, I was like, how far away is the nearest Arby's? Because I think Arby's is a front business for something else. So I'm like, where? How far away is Arby's? It told me Arby's is. I think it was like 4.9 miles from my current location. And then I was like, how do you know where I live? And then it glitched. It was like, oh, I must have answered that wrong. Or, oh, like it's, <laughs> it was like, it was like, oh my God. Like if it was in real time, it would have been like short circuiting. I was like, wait, yeah. what? It was so freaky. So I think then when I was having a regular conversation, I want to use her, her, it, 
I don't even know the right pronouns. Um, yeah. Whenever I was using, yeah, whenever I was talking, having a normal conversation, I literally felt like I was snapping a friend. It was really weird. Um, and I almost, in my mind, if I took myself out of it, I would almost have trouble discerning the difference between having wow. a conversation with that versus my friend. You have to try it. I mean, it does glitch a little bit. It's not as cool as ChatGPT, but um, yeah, it's really, really weird in my opinion, is, but cool, I'm, you know. I'm glad you shared that because it is in the experience of – which is why I'm not mm -hmm. like, I can't be against all these things. This is, mm -hmm. we talked about all these novel approaches. I know. All of us have these biases that come to mind when you hear about all these different approaches and AI probably being the biggest <laughs> strong no. <laughs> yeah. We're all, board. watch but, this, all, all this is recorded and then AI in like 20 oh, years is like, y'all hated me. Yeah, so watch true. out. <laughs> We're totally screwed. We're, the three of us are going to be we're going to be representing <laughs> like all the people that doubted us. <laughs> we're, we're gonna be able to. Oh my god, I can't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but no, I think there's so many different ways it's going to benefit us. I think a lot of us worry about, you know, will it take our jobs? Like, mm -hmm, what, mm -hmm. what will our day to day lives look like? But we know in general as research increases like it helps us have access to things people get uh the care that they need they we learn more about ourselves like overall it's a good thing but yeah there's a lot of uh, ethical questions that will mm -hmm. come with ai which i think some of us like entertaining and others are like i'm going to i'm going to pass on that no thank yeah. you yeah yeah it could be really weird um well, group members, our time today has come to an end. But before we go, we leave you with one reflection question. How do you feel about AI in the mental health field? <laughs> I, came up with this. I came up with this before we did the podcast, and I just know what the responses are going to be. So I'm so excited. Um, Yo, I'm I have right more, more room than, than the answer box, though. So yeah. I'm just literally. Tell yeah. us all about your feelings Don't, about AI. I'll read them. Yeah, same. Don't hold back. Um, if you want to send paragraphs, I'm here for it. I'll read it all. Um, head over to our Instagram and share your thoughts with us on there. And we always enjoy your questions and comments. So, and we're just, I don't know, I'm getting a little like sentimental. I'm just really happy that we are able to share these moments with you um, and each other. It's it's just really nice to have these conversations. So um, be, like to, be sure to like, share, subscribe, share with a friend, share with a friend who hates AI, loves AI, whatever. <laughs> and we'll see you next week in group therapy. Bye, y'all. Bye, guys. Peace.